by thanking all of you for being here for this very important and uh, very special presentation from one of the true leaders in central New York. And um, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Bill Byrne, who's the former president of Byrne Dairy. So Bill's grandfather, Matthew Byrne, started bottling and delivering milk in horse-pulled wagons to local families in Syracuse in 1933. People actually could watch milk being processed in bottles from the sidewalk through large glass windows in the company's production uh, facility. Aside from working with the, within the family business, Bill was president of Burn Dairy from 1997 to 2007 and was inducted into the Manufacturers Association of Central New York's Wall of Fame in 2014. He retired the same year to serve as chairman, but his family's remained in the dairy business for more than 90 years. Bill's sons, Carl and Mark, currently serve as CEOs and recently received a proclamation from on Onondaga County Executive Ryan McMahon for their 90 years in business, where February 3rd, 2023, was known as Burn Dairy Day. So Bill attended Syracuse schools through the eighth grade and graduated from Christian Brothers Academy and then from Dart College. He then served two years in the Peace Corps in Nepal as an agricultural extension agent. He's now in retirement after a 42-year career at Burn Dairy, including, as I said, 10 years as president. During his career, the Burn family expanded its operations to include four production plants, 60 convenience stores, over 1,200 employees. And now, even in retirement, Bill has been involved with a number of community organizations. He served three years as chair of the Syracuse Neighborhood Initiative from 2003 to 2005, raising local funds to augment $50 million in federal funding to improve housing in Syracuse. He served four years on the New York Federal Reserve Board Committee on Small Business and Agri Agriculture. He's a 20-year member of the local Salvation Army Advisory Board, including two years as their board chair. He recently served as board president for Literacy Central New York, dedicated to improving adult literacy, and is a current board member of the Syracuse Symphony Foundation. Page two is still in my binder. Hang on here. Burn Dairy has grown into a substantial business and corporation. It's a regional family-owned producer and distributor of milk, cream, and ice cream that works with local dairy farms. They currently have manufacturing facilities, warehouses, a corporate headquarters, extended shelf life, and ultra-pasteurization plants, all based in central New York. According to them, Burn's average farm is only 35 miles from our plants where they receive around 50 million pounds of milk each month. Hard to believe. In addition, I am very proud and pleased to introduce to all of you Nancy Phipps Byrne. Nancy graduated from Wells in 1973. She chose Wells because she wanted a small school. She went to Syracuse uh, University as a graduate student to study Spanish and taught as a graduate assistant. Several years ago, Nancy shared that she volunteers for the Pebble Hill Presbyterian Church and Syracuse Stage. At the church, she's an ordained deacon and ordained elder. In 2003, she and Bill were honored with the 21st Annual Interreligious Leader Award. They live in Syracuse. They have two children and five grandchildren. It is my pleasure to introduce to all of you Bill Byrne. That was a great job, Jonathan. I, I, I think that's as good an introduction as I've ever had. Unfortunately, only three grandchildren, not five. But, Sorry but, about you know, that. I, uh, <laughs> but you did a lovely job, and thank you so much. You. Um, it's really a pleasure for Nancy and I to be here today. Um, and uh, the theme really is economic development in central New York. But first, I'm going to um, spend some time on the Burn Dairy story. And um, I think that, that what I'm going to try to do is, is, to, is to present some of the issues that have that have you know um, been very important to us in the growth of Burn Dairy and its development, 
we're going to see spilling over into the situation that we have on our hands now, which is the Micron expansion in central New York. Um, and I'm going to spend hopefully 15, 20 minutes on that. And um, um, I'm not an expert on the semi-computer business, okay? So there's some videos that I'm going to try to let um, Micron speak for itself. But um, uh, hopefully we, we can have a little discussion on, on Micron and, and the effect uh, that, that we're all uh, looking forward to. But anyway, let, let's go ahead and start with Burn Burn Dairy here, okay? There's um, horses outside the barn. This picture was probably taken around 1948. This isn't actually the earliest one. Um, but um, you're not going to get too far with horses and wagons, right? Here's, a, here's an early uh, ad. And I think the interesting thing about this ad is, is uh, right in one spot there, it says, it talks about uh, uh, that one serving supplies 18% of protein. And here we are 90 years later, and um, certainly we, we think the best, you know, the, the, the best selling point for dairy products right now is, is protein. So um, from, a, from a nutritional standpoint, you know, we're still talking about the same issues. Um, my grandfather was an entrepreneur, um, kind of before they invented the word. He built that building right there in downtown Syracuse in 1926 and um, lost everything in the crash of, of, uh, of uh, 29. Um, he didn't know what to do with the building. Decided to get into the dairy industry because, or in the milk business because he felt that it was a repeat sale, that he, he could sell people a product and sell them that product again next week. And it turned out he was right. Um, you know, it worked out well. Um, still with horses and wagons here. Um, interestingly enough, the first truck deliveries, 1941. I mean, 1941 was the year that of Pearl Harbor. I, how they managed to last until 1941 with no trucks is is pretty amazing. But uh, that's what they did. Um, picture similar to the. Um, um, one before this this plant was actually built in 1948 and um, is still operating okay uh, we'll talk a little bit about this plant a little bit later but um, that's right outside the the building on Oneida Street um, believe it or not this is the first burned dairy store in uh, Central Square in New York um, and it certainly doesn't look like much um, but I, I, the sign out there says two quarts for 90, for, I think it's 46 cents, okay? Those were the good old days, okay? So a lot's changed, but um, you, know, you you got to start somewhere. And I think the interesting thing about the dairy stores in terms of the overall uh, picture was that society had really changed, okay? Um, there, was, there were now a lot more women were, were working outside the home. They weren't, they weren't home to you know, accept the delivery from the milkman. Um, the supermarket chains were starting to grow, and um, this, this step into retail, um, at the time that we did it in 1954, there was a lot of competition from a lot of small dairies around Syracuse, and we were the only ones that survived. And um, it's probably because we had, you know, we were, willing to, we were willing to do the work, okay? We were willing to get into retailing, to, to go through everything that you have to do to, to do that, okay? And other companies weren't willing to do that and didn't, and didn't survive. So the, the, the stores, and we'll talk about the stores. What's really happened is there's been the development into two separate businesses. One is the, um, the, the, the processing side that we're gonna talk a lot about today. And then um, also the dairy stores themselves are, have become a, a very, you know, a convenience store chain, very similar to a lot of chains across the country. Um, 1957, uh, there's our first bulk milk truck. Um, milk had been handled in, in 10 gallon cans before that. Um, and the conversion to, to bulk was a major step forward. Um, we have always been very close to our uh, farm supply. Okay, um, there's a fairly modern picture there. Um, we are very blessed to have the milk supply in central New York that we have. Um, and we've, we, to the point where um, we, we certainly feel that the, the, the central New York milk supply is um, you know, a strategic advantage that, that has allowed us to compete um, with other people. Um, uh, there's really not a better milk supply any place in the country. 
um, as far as I'm concerned, than, than, than New York State. And we have, we have a great farming community. Um, they, they've made a lot more money than a lot of people give them credit for. <laughs> there are some farmers out there that have, that have been very successful here in New York State. Um, and um, I think the times are tough now. I think the problem is, th is the way prices go up and down are, are very difficult for farmers. But um, the land is good here. Um, the environment is, has been very uh, um, conducive to, to dairy uh, farming, and it, it's worked well. Okay. Here, there's, there's a delivery truck. Um, I, I get pretty nuts about transportation costs, okay? That's, um, you're, you're going to hear that from me a little couple more times before we get out of this today. Um, this was one driver on, on a truck that held about 30 cases of milk, okay? And we would go out and pedal. You know, the only thing that's missing from the earlier picture, it's not a horse anymore, but it's the same style of delivery, okay? And we lasted doing that until 1977, which really was pretty long, was you know? But... Um, the, the days of home delivery um, were gone just because of the costs were so high. Um, in 1978, we got into the ice cream business. Um, what, one of the things you're going to hear is, is that we kind of developed in a stepwise basis, okay? We, we started as a very small, you know, operation. We, we, we grew the, the, the milk plant. We opened a new milk plant. We, we improved the equipment there. We expanded the product line. We got into things like not just glass bottles, but paper cartons also. Um, in 1978, we get into the, um, into the ice cream business. Um, and the ice cream business has been a lot of fun. Um, you can make a lot of different products. You know, look at Ben and Jerry's. Nobody's had more fun than them. Um, and um, uh, it's the, the really nice thing about the ice cream business is that it's very easy to, it's, it's, well, it's not totally easy, but it's very possible to make a product that, that's very different from anybody else's. So it's easy for product differentiation. Um, and that's, that's very good because it allows you to do something it'll maybe at a little different price point, okay? Um, here, here's a, this is an ad from, 19, it takes a second to get started here, 1987, okay, that we did. Hopefully. No sound. So I don't know if our sound guys can help here. It doesn't seem to be muted. He and his, interesting you should bring that up. Give us a chance to talk about that. Uh, they were, he, was, he and his brother were in the tire business together. Had a very, very big falling out. They built the building for, really for, for, uh, to be displayed for the, for the tire business. And then he and his brother had a, had a big fight and separated. And um, so that was, that's what they did before was, was the tire business in that building. All right, we got it. Hi, I'm Bill Burke. All our Blue Berry ice cream flavors are subjected to a taste test performed by our own flavor experts, like my children, Sarah and David Burke. What's your favorite flavor, Sarah? Mint chocolate chip, because there are lots of chocolate chips in it. I see you eating rainbow sherbet, Dave. How is it? Great, Dad. All our delicious burn <laughs> ice cream and sherbet flavors have passed the official burn taste test. So why not let your ice cream experts sample some burn dairy ice cream today? 
Okay, so, so those are my two kids. Um, you know, a lot of time's gone by. Um, they, uh, I'm gonna, I'm, let's see if I can advance here. Um, we had a little trouble with this earlier. Just click on it. Oh, I got it, okay, all right. So, so here's the glass bottle. Um, I just wanna tell you about my kids for a minute. Okay, so Sarah, Sarah's book is, is now selling well. She's a chaplain at, at uh, Massachusetts General Hospital. My son's an artist and a teacher, and uh, they're doing great. We have three grandchildren, so we've been very fortunate. But that was Nancy's long-term project, was the kids. I was, nobody ever accused me of having the good work-life balance. Okay, so. And we're gonna talk about that some more, too, when we get to Micron, okay? Uh, Okay, major expansion in 1989-90, and this is the first time that we really got deeply involved with the state in terms of economic development. We were located in West Lone, what was known as an empire zone, um, downtown in Syracuse, so um, there, was a, there was very favorable um, programs at the state, and this was the first time that we really did an economic development project with, with significant funding from the, the government. Now, it was, it was certainly less than a million dollars, but um, I believe it was about 15% of, of the project value was, was uh, provided by the state. And, and that, was, that was a very big deal. It was a very big deal then, and it's a very big deal now in terms of economic development. Um, we started blowing our own bottles there. That's a, that's a blow molder on the, on the left side of the picture. And um, that was just a very important thing, that, that if you were going to stay in the business, in the fluid, in the fluid milk business, um, gallons are a very, very much a commodity product. It's very hard to distinguish your product from anybody else's. But, um, so if you're gonna do it, you better be efficient, and, um, and that's what we did. Um, there's a cooler that we added in 1997 that really, really helped that plant. Um, and interestingly enough, um, the only, the way we, that we were able to expand that, that, whole, that entire space was occupied by a firehouse in New York City, or not New York City, but Syri a Syracuse City firehouse. Um, and they actually sold, it was kind of in tough shape, and they sold it to us, built a new firehouse four blocks away, and enabled our expansion. And that was pretty good when you think about that. You know, we, we've, we've always been treated pretty well by the, um, uh, the city of Syracuse, has, has always worked with us very closely, and the county, and the state. Um, this is a picture of me. That's Governor David Patterson right behind me on the, on the uh, left there. Um, we were announcing, uh, uh, it was actually an announcement with respect to um, low-cost power being available to manufacturers through, the, through NIPA, the New York Power Authority. The interesting thing about this picture is, you know how the politicians are. I don't know how I managed to get the microphone away from David Patterson, but, you know, so I, I thought that, that was an accomplishment. But... Um, uh, just another example of working with the state is, is something that, that's very, very, you know, beneficial to a company like ours. Um, I, I like this lady right here. She's, this is a lady out of the plant. She has her, uh, she has her, her, her um, um, what do they call that, dear? Her hairnet. She's got her hairnet on. Try getting a hairnet on a politician if you've, uh, <laughs> take it from me, that's a hard thing to do. Okay, now, um, Okay, we've expanded the milk plant. Things are going well. We've developed a lot of major customers at this point. We're, we're supplying people like, like um, um, uh, Walmart and, and Costco. Not Costco yet. Not, that would be too early for Costco. But um, um, we, we're starting to do some major chains. We expanded our delivery system all the way into New England. And... Um, uh, and that was doing well, but still in a commodity business. And um, here's what we were really faced with, is, is the drop in per capita consumption of, of fluid milk, okay? And, um, you know, I don't like this any better than, you know, I mean, it, it, it reflects a couple of things. Um, one is obviously substitution products, soy milk, oat milk. Um, uh, there's a number of factors involved in this, but it's not a pretty picture when, when your product sales are dropping by almost 50% in a 50-year period, okay? On the other hand, here's, here's um, cream and half and half sales in New York State right about the time that we expanded the plant. And what we, what we, were, what we were getting, what we were starting to get across the country was what we call the Starbucks effect, okay? Star 
Did you have that? I said thanks, Starbucks. Yeah, thanks, Starbucks. Yeah. So Starbucks, Starbucks was revolutionizing the way we drink coffee and, and needed, you know, millions and millions of pounds of half and half, and the product was really growing. So we decided to get into this business. Um, here's, this was an ad that we did for, um, for, the, um, for the plant and some of the products there, okay? Now this is ultra pasteurized, and we're gonna talk about this for a second here in a minute. There's, there's the plant there, 40,000 square foot plant. We started in 2003, had it open in 2004, okay? So it was actually about 15 months from shoveling the ground to, to a product coming out of the plant, which was huge, okay? And we're gonna talk about that with Micron too, okay? It's, it's a huge issue for them, but it's a very different time frame. Um, there's, there's some of the processing equipment, um, a lot of it from Europe, okay? Um, interestingly enough, in the food processing industry, um, Europe has always been kind of ahead of the United States. You know, we think of ourselves as, as technological leaders pretty much across the board. That's not really true in the dairy industry. Louis, Louis Pasteur was French, right? Okay, the Venn's pasteurization. A lot of the equipment, this, equi this equipment comes from a company called Tetra Pak that's based in Sweden. They actually do um, produce stuff here in the United States. But being able to qualify those suppliers, being able to work with the kind of equipment that we needed was, was a skill set that we had within the company just from our years in the flu standard fluid milk business. We had grown enough that we were able to deal with this, okay? Um, I'm just gonna spend a minute on this here. Um, there's, there's basically three different processes, and what we're doing is we're heating the milk here. Um, regular pasteurization is this one right here. Am I getting my, is that, yeah, that's showing good. Um, regular pasteurization is, is down here at uh, about 100 and little, they're showing about 175 degrees. At 175 degrees, you do not kill all the bacteria, okay? So there's, there's, there's heat, um, stable, um, uh, microorganisms that, that, that will survive. Now, none of them will make you sick. We killed all the coli, all the salmonella, all the, all, any, any kind of bacteria that will, that what they call a pathogen, is, is very easily killed by pasteurization. And, um, um, but, so you can, you can get three to four weeks and eat at refrigerated temperatures, some of these bacteria over time will grow. And that's why fluid milk, you know, you buy a 2% gallon of milk, it's got a three week cold life for maybe four weeks or maybe uh, the rotation was poor and it's three days, but you know, it's pretty short. Uh, okay, so now there's two different types of, of high temperature products here and you can see the temperatures are pretty much the same. The indirect UHT is a, was kind of a closed pipe process that originated in Europe really, you know, um, back in the 70s and 80s, and this is old technology. And, and um, the problem is that if you look, th this is the time scale across the bottom here, and if you look at right about here from about 40 seconds to about 100 seconds, that product is really hot. And it's in contact with metal and, and a really, really cooked flavor forms that, that never goes away. So the product always tasted bad, and um, um, I, think that, I think that the aseptic industry and the ultra-pasteurized industry is still overcoming the, that, um, the fact that there was so much product that, that tasted bad that was put out. What we use at Ultra for both ultra-pasteurized products and aseptic products, and we're gonna talk about that just a little bit, um, the difference there. Ultra-pasteurized products um, are, are heated to a, are essentially sterile, but the packaging is not constructed to give you a really, really long shelf life. You can get 60, 90 days, maybe 120 days on some special plastic products, but the, the, it's the packaging that determines the shelf life. But the process itself, what we do is we heat up, we have a plate heat exchanger that takes the product to about uh, 185, and then we directly inject steam into the product, okay? And um, that steam is like at 300 degrees. And you can see it basically takes the product from 180 to about 280 pretty much instantaneously, okay? And then it's held for two seconds. And then it's cooled down in what's called a flash vessel. And basically what it is is that there's a very, very um, sudden drop in the pressure. And, and the steam that we injected in, we evaporate back off and the product comes out. 
it's pretty it's really an amazing process and there's that that's that is a um that is a um uh, uh processing unit right there the this is the homogenizer over here this is the flash vessel where the product after it's been it, steam has been injected um it 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 um evaporates out of there okay let's move on here um so things are going pretty good you know we managed to get this plant up and running um we're in a, a buying group called All-Star Dairy Association of about 70 or 80 of the best dairies in the country. Um, I think one of the things that I need to talk about here with, that's really worked for us is looking outside the company, okay? W one of the things that All-Star did for us was there was a lot of small dairies, relatively small dairies, compared to a couple of the top dairies in the country that were much bigger so we have a size we have a size disadvantage and where that really shows up for a lot of for a lot of operations like us is in purchasing okay so this all-star dairy association is really a purchasing association where we combine our volume with other with other dairies and then we're we probably never match some of the really top very big dairy. Kroger, for example, operates their own milk plant, actually a series of milk plants across the country. Some of the biggest plants in the country are owned by Kroger. Um, Safeway does the same thing in California. Um, they're, you know they're buying better than you are, okay? And when somebody buys better than you, you got a problem, okay? And um, it's going to catch up with you sooner or later. So, um, this is one way for us to combat that. We received that award. There's a 2% gallon right there in the front. Um, you know, we're still, we're still very much in the fluid milk business. Um, but we did receive that uh, Dairy of the Year Award in 2004. Um, and Ultra takes off like a rocket, okay? Um, this is 2009. This is the first major, ex I don't know how we operated in, in these conditions. You look, you look at, I mean, the, there's this huge brown, you know, driveway all the way around the plant. This whole white section here is all the new part here, okay? Um, and some of this, the white roof, the white roof sections over here are new. And so every, actually all the white roofs are all new in, in 2009. Um, that was about a $30 million expansion, I believe. Um, I haven't talked enough about our employees. Um, but what's happening is we're obviously dealing with a different level of customer than we dealt with before, and we need people with a different level of skill sets. And I want to talk about one lady who, here who's uh, this lady right here on the left. Her name is Mary Cam. And Carl brought my cousin Carl, who runs the dairy now and was actually running the dairy then. Um, this was after I was president. Um, brought Mary Cam in because we just didn't have anybody in the quality assurance department that really could deal with the national customers, okay? The national customers are a different breed of cat. They have, they work with a different set of, 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 um, of rules. They, they've got hundreds of stores out there. They, they want things right and they ain't kidding around. And you better be able to demonstrate that to them. Um, Mary Cam's background, uh, actually she worked for Ben and Jerry's for a number of years. She did fish food, remember fish food, that flavor? She did the formula for that. She had to get the band to approve it. She said that was an interesting day. Um, <laughs> she, she worked for them. She, she was the National Quality Assurance Manager for Safeway for a while. And then she, worked, uh, then she came to work for us. And she was really able to, you know, to lead us to another level in terms of assuring that these, to these customers that Burn Dairy was going to do a good job for them. And, uh, and, and then just, you know, a number of people, you know, there's just a lot of skill sets that you have to develop. Um, most of the people in, in this picture are pretty, te pretty technically um, uh, oriented in terms of testing and, and uh, quality assurance, the routine stuff on a day-to-day -day basis. But um, this lady in the back here is, is actually ran our, you know, uh, was, was a fabulous manager in terms of our, our milk supply. And... Um, I think she's still doing it. I think she's still there. Okay. Um, now we put in, we go to France. We have to go back to Europe. We put a plastic bottle line in from France that we bought from a company called Sidel. Um, I got to go to Paris on that one. That was fun. 
Um, didn't, we didn't get to stay long. But um, we put in this plastic bottle line, um, and the, the full investment there was $28 million, um, not just for that line, but for the expansion, too. Um, that's my granddaughter there. That's Lena drinking out of the plastic bottle. We always thought that was a cute picture. Um, and then here in 2019, we get out of the fluid, the standard fluid milk business. Okay, we packed it in. Um, and look, at, I had just retired. I, I, probably, I probably wouldn't have been able to do this, but my cousin Carl, who was really a great manager, you know, it was time to get out, okay? Um, so we left the business that we started in, okay? And um, that was a difficult day, certainly for me, but um, I believe it was the right thing to do just in terms of, of competitive, the competitive situation that we're in and what we were looking at in the future. Um, and now the, the next step for us is aseptic milk, often labeled as UHT, and, and there's really three differences, okay? Um, the packaging always includes an oxygen barrier layer, usually aluminum. And I've, I've got, these are aseptic packages right here. I thought maybe I could, we just pass them around so you could take a look at them here. Um, oh, here, I, you can take one of each. Um, and you've seen, I mean, this is a very familiar looking package, right? You know, for juice drinks and things, okay? But, but not so much for dairy products, okay? And, um, Okay, so that, that's the latest and greatest thing, and that seems to be working really, really well for us. Okay, it's the, ent the entry to this business has been um, very successful. Um, okay, in 2022, um, just the expansion in, into that and some additional uh, ultra-pasteurized business, um, there we are doing another expansion. Um, so this plant looks a lot different than it did back when we first opened it, and... Uh, um, we've just been very fortunate. We just, you know, you keep your nose to the, to the grindstone and you just keep uh, trying to innovate and trying to, you know, trying to meet customers' needs and, um, and it's worked out very well. Okay, that's what that plant looks like today. And it's a monster to run. It really is. You got all those tanks. There's a lot of product coming in and out. Um, there's a lot of uh, processing, a lot of packaging. Okay, where do you hear this one now? Okay. Let's say that, that, that Burn Dairy's expansion is a one-inch circle, okay? All right? The circle equivalent to that for Micron's expansion that is coming is the, the one-inch diameter. Micron's diameter is 55 feet, okay? So $100 billion coming, you know, these days. This is really going to be something. We're going to talk about that in a minute here. A couple minutes. i got a few more minutes. Okay, uh, and here we are in 2022, which is, you know, just the year before last. We get the Dairy Foods, we get the award for uh, Dairy Foods Plant of the Year. Um, I think the interesting thing about this picture here is that, you know, there's five um, men staying on the uh, stairway there. Only two of them are family members. The other three are, are all people that Carl brought in with skills in finance. Um, one, one actually is a lawyer. I used to kid this guy here. He's, our, he's the lawyer, Jim Gozier. And I would go to his office and, you know, like you, you had to step across the step. And I would say, you know, reality like totally changed, you know, when you, <laughs> you go into the lawyer's office. But um, he's done a great job for us. He's, you know, just the contracts and you know, again, dealing with big customers, he's done a wonderful job. The guy at the top of the steps is actually a logistic expert, um, Ken Woods. Believe it or not, I mean, he, co he commutes from, from Oregon. You know, he'll come and stay for a week and then, and then go back for a couple days and then uh, flying back and forth across the country. I, I'm not sure if I like his carbon footprint, but um, he's a great guy. Um, okay, so again, we're, we're, we, we're, we're looking at possibilities to, to um, we're looking at two possibilities now. One of the problems that we've had since we've become a big dairy is brand management, okay? Um, a lot of our expansion was in private label. Um, as a matter of fact, all the aseptic products that I brought today are private labels. You don't see a burn label on those products. Um, trying to... Um, take care of private label business 
and still trying to, to have a brand. Now, we've had a good brand, certainly, in the milk business and the ice cream and the stores and all that here in upstate New York. But go to Long Island or go to Pennsylvania or go to um, Houston, okay, and nobody knows us, okay? Now, I don't think we'll ever get to Houston, but we would like to be a, a more regional brand than we are. Let's put it that way. And we wanted to develop more brand, and, and that's where the Burn Hollow Farms uh, concept came up in relation to um, – the, the expansion in Cortlandville in 2012, okay? Um, and the plant really, um, one thing about this, uh, there's, you know, this is really Carl's project. There's, you know, there's supposed to be cows in the yard. There's supposed to be a visitor center. Maybe we'll get there. I don't know. I, I guess, um, where's the lady? I guess there's three windmills, right? Yeah, so right. three windmills there, yeah. So we, we did get some windmills up. Um, and I don't know what the, you know, it's, it's, um, that, that's what they are. Um, but the plant, the plant, we opened the plant. We were making Greek yogurt. Um, that looks familiar, doesn't it? Okay. So I'm sure we use the same architect. Um, pretty much the same. It's a difference. There's differences in the technology, but basically it's, it's, it's the same level of technology. Um, the graph looks a little bit different. What happened was the, the, the growth in the yogurt business leveled out. Okay, and you can see it leveled out almost exactly when we got in the business. And um, so we, we were not successful in the, Greek, in the Greek yogurt business. And we've now um, uh, retooled Cortlandville to, to be an aseptic plant. Okay, so we're, and it's now producing aseptic product as is being produced at the other plant in, um, in East Syracuse. And what's really nice about that, what's really nice about having two plants is if you have a power failure, or if, if there was some kind of tragedy or something, if, you, if something really, you know, if you had a, you know, God forbid you have a fire in a plant like this, um, you know, we, we would have some backup and we have some uh, assurance that we'd be able to take care of the customers. Um, but uh, interestingly enough, just a couple of comments about the yogurt business. Um, obviously, the big star in the yogurt business is Chobani, who really brought Greek yogurt to the United States. Uh, the, you know, I, I mean, I, I kind of feel guilty here in the sense that, you know, old Burn Dairy, you know, we did such a great job. There's a lot of stories that make us look like Peanutville, okay? I mean, Chobani went from zero to a billion dollars in sales in five years. You know, I mean, it's, it's probably the most remarkable story in the food business, you know, ever. Um, just, just a great story. They've done a great job. Um, but I don't know. I mean, things have leveled out. And when they level out for, uh, for everybody, that includes Chobani. So um, this graph did not continue on the, on the curve that it might have. Uh, the interesting thing here is if you look at the consumption, we're at about uh, 15 pounds per person per year. Switzerland's at 50, okay? So maybe it's going to happen just a little bit slower than we, than we thought, but um, the, the, the graph didn't do everything we wanted it to, okay? So anyway, there's the plant. Um, it's there. It's operating. Um, we, we have great hopes for it, and um, I, I really hope that we get the visitor center up someday. Um, we, we, again, go all the way back to the beginning of the company. It's, it's, about, it's about your relationship with customers is, is what's the most important thing. Um, I'm going to spend a very, very short amount of time on the dairy store business. Um, as, as I said before, um, actually, uh, it was really Carl's father, Vin, got us into the dairy store business in 1954. Um, and we operated these little stores primarily just primarily we called them dairy stores that's what we called them because they were really designed to do that you can see there's no gas pumps in front of those uh either one of those stores um things are different now okay um and there's one point i really want to make about the stores actually let me wait till we get to mark here i'll get to that in a minute but anyway um the convenience store business is, is an animal unto itself. Uh, there's been a lot of successful companies across the country in the convenience store business. Um, as the ones that come to mind, Stewart's out of Saratoga Springs. I don't know if you, I'm sure you're all familiar with them. Great, great company, great family business, the Dakes. Um, not two good friends of ours. We, can, we compete with them, so, you know. <laughs> we respect the Dakes, but, you know. Um, but anyway, um, 
the Morabito family out of Rome, New York. Done of, or, uh, actually, I guess it's more closely, maybe it's closer to Utica. I'm not quite sure. But they are, they're um, done a great job. They, they're, they, they're, they love the energy business over at uh, Morabito's. Um, but one point about this is now you can see the gas island looks bigger than the store. Okay, on this store, this is our Thompson Road store. Um, the dairy store business is a very funny combination of the gas business and what happens inside the store. And, and we've worked very hard to develop uh, things there. This is, uh, this is the Lafayette. We think that's a really nice looking picture of that store. Um, it's important to people. People want to come into a place that looks nice, okay? Um, and certainly that's, you know, I, I, I see that here at Wells College, that's for sure. I mean, you drive in this place, it's, an, it's impressive, you know? Um, Okay, um, one of the things that we're, that we're working very hard at is the, the deli department at, the, at, the, at, at our stores. Um, I think that they've done a great job on this. It, it's, um, it's really, um, it's been very successful. Um, and, here, and here inside, there's, there's a lot of labor. There's a lot of, um, you know, um, uh, quality assurance uh, subjects that you have to comply with and deal with. Um, you know, and people come in and buy breakfast pizza, you know, I, I don't know how they do it, but I mean, it's pretty amazing, the, the product mix that, that happens during the week there, but, or during the day. Um, but it's going real well, okay? I think they've done a good job in advertising. Is there, are there any Burn Dairy Athletes of the Week here with us today? I thought there might be one or two. Sometimes, there's Burn Dairy Athletes of the Week everywhere, okay? And I'm sure you've probably seen that advertising on TV, which I think has been very successful. Um, okay, current leadership are, um, this is Mark and Carl. They're not my sons, they're my cousins, okay? But it was, that was still pretty good. That was close. Um, and they're, they're younger than I am, obviously. They're, they're in their, you know, late 50s, early 60s now. Um, Carl is the one that, that realized that, you know, the fluid milk business with the drop in consumption and the shift to the, um, the Starbucks effect that we were seeing in half and half gave us an opportunity to, to get into, uh, into extended shelf life products. So that really was Carl's baby. Mark has run the stores for his entire career. Um, Mark's kind of a rough character. <laughs> um, it's kind of interesting. They're very different people. But um, Mark, where Mark has done a fabulous job is he's built a really, really strong management team. And he treats people very well. And he gives them a lot of responsibility, and he tells them what he's looking for, and they work together, and they've, they've just done a great job. Um, we're, one of the things, again, that they did extremely effectively was, was um, reaching outside the company, looking for best practices across the entire industry on a national basis, and who can they talk to that's going to help them, okay? And they, they actually got involved with a thing called a share group, of convenience store chains from around the country. And um, um, interestingly enough, the, the, you look at the convenience store and you go, well, they're selling gas and they have this and they, you know, there's a grocery aisle and stuff. It's all about data management. It's all about transferring data from the, from the fuel pumps, authorizing credit cards, lotto tickets, um, you know, just all kinds of, of transactions, you know, uh, selling people alcohol and tobacco and, and, and making sure that you're doing that legally, um, uh, managing a price book, doing promotions, um, all that stuff's all done by computer. You know, it's, it's your computing system is, is what, what runs that entire program. And um, uh, they, based on information from that share group, that's where they got the enterprise software system that they're using that's been very, very successful for them. So um, again, you know, um, you have to be humble enough to, to realize that you don't know it all and you, and you have to look outside of, of um, your own operation and maybe you've got to go overseas, maybe you've got to go to France, maybe you've got to go to um, some place in Texas where, you know, there's a better convenience store chain than you are and, and the best thing for you to do is admit that and try to learn from them. Um, Okay, we're still a family business. Um, there's four different families involved in that picture. There I am right there. This is my younger brother, Tom. Uh, there's Mark back there. Um, here's Carl, uh, you know, who's really running the company. Right here is Ryan Elliott, who is my cousin's son. 
Um, he's a lawyer. He, um, uh, he's, a, he's a terrific young man. Um, he spent three years working the second shift at, at Ultra um, and, and being the, the production manager. I, and he still does a lot of production manager not, stuff now. I think he's kind of moved, he's moving more into general management. But, you know, Ryan can probably run the company for the fourth generation. We'll see. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how it's all going to work out, but um, and this is his brother right here is Peter. So they're both fourth generation. Um, but I, I, I really expect Ryan for, you know, that the time that he put in, you know, um, second shift is the hardest shift, right? So you got to start at four o'clock in the afternoon. You get out at midnight. And if you have a family, I don't know how you see them, right? Other than, you know, the days that you don't work at all. It's really tough. It's really tough. You miss all the, all the all the athletic events that happen after school. Now you know he's Ryan's young enough. Maybe he can get away with that. I don't th I don't think he had. He, I don't think he has any children yet. So he's pretty young. But um, this is my niece uh, Kate. She's worked in sales. She's working in logistics now. Um, so we you know we have some fourth generation family members that that are doing a great job. Okay. Um, okay. So that's enough of Burn Dairy. Okay. Actually, we're doing pretty good. Was it, is it quarter after now? How are we doing? Okay. So now we're, now we're going to shift gears. And now instead of that one-inch circle, we're going to talk about the 55-foot behemoth. Okay. Um, and this is Micron Corporation. Do you want me to stop it? <clears throat> Look at that. The system fell asleep just the way I always did in class. Here we go, baby. <laughs> okay, now I'm getting to the next slide is going to be interesting, I'm afraid. Let's see if we how we do here. No. So you think you know Wix? No. Do you really? You you I think you guys gotta get me to the next slide somehow. Okay. <laughs> I think we've lost the whole program here. Yeah, I don't know where I don't know even where oh, okay. Okay, all right. Press the bottom button first and then this one. Okay. All right. Now we're gonna let we're gonna let Micron talk for themselves now here. Okay. It's exciting to know that this is the largest semiconductor facility. This is Sanjay in Vermont. You're gonna hear his name a lot. Okay. Right here in central New York. We are one of the world's top semiconductor companies founded in Boise, Idaho more than four decades ago. And Boise remains our headquarters today. We design and manufacture memory and storage semiconductors. Tiny, Governor showed the chip. I have to show it to you again in case you missed it. These are tiny. This is our chip. <laughs> tiny, but powerful. Powerful and at the heart of nearly every computing system. From the smartphone in your pocket to the driver safety system in your car to the vast 
gas, data centers, and communication systems critical to everyday life and to our national security. We chose New York for this leading edge fab for several reasons. First, New York has a long history of semiconductor development and manufacturing and offers promising opportunity for the memory sector. Second, Central New York offers a rich pool <coughs> of diverse talent. This includes communities that today are underrepresented in technology jobs and a significant military population. Over the years, Micron has found that veterans, in particular, have strong skill sets for the technical roles needed in semiconductor manufacturing. <laughs> Third, New York provides strong education partnerships with K local K-12 programs, community colleges, and leading higher education institutions for top engineering and technical talent, extremely important to the semiconductor industry. And fourth, and extremely importantly, access to clean, reliable power and water to support a project of this massive scale while achieving our long-term environmental goals. Fifth, there is much to offer here for unique uh, in, in terms of uh, for Micron employees and their families in terms of the environment, urban and outdoor lifestyles and affordable cost of living and a strong local school system. We plan to invest up to $100 billion with the first phase investment of $20 billion planned by the end of this decade. Micron's central New York site could eventually include as Senator Schumer shared earlier, 600,000 square feet clean rooms. And yes, that is equivalent of 40 U.S. football fields. And certainly, by far, the largest semiconductor clean room ever announced in the United States. So this is something, huh? It's exciting to know. This Caroline's trip to Boise and Mike Front headquarters continues for the man who ultimately decided the town of Clay was the best location for the company's biggest project ever. News Channel Line's Andrew Donovan sits down with him, the executive in charge of expansion across the country. So do you think nearby you'll see a lot of those, you know, um, support functions have office space and warehouse space? If you look in the outer race, radius, it'll drive additional economic development into the, into the area. Our team members, will, you know, and those employees of our partner companies will also live in the area. So if you think about it, you know, 50% of our team members will probably live within a 15-minute drive radius. But then if, as you go out, you know, you'll get to an hour drive and 10% of our team members will live out, out that way. So if you think, you know, that's going to have impact on the community. Then associated with all that, um, when you look at manufacturing jobs, they bring money into a community. That's going to create dentist office, you know, grocery stores, gas stations, restaurants, all of this other economic activity that will go around there. And that's why when you look at the total impact, It'll create over 40,000 jobs in the community, and that's going to be a great, wonderful benefit for everyone there because there will be additional amenities that are brought in by this economic development. And on this week, you can follow Andrew Donovan in Boise, Idaho, visiting Micron. He'll give us reports for the Lines trip. My work-life balance, my job, my peers, all my benefits, like I think that that's super unique. So I have a hybrid schedule. I work two days at home and we get to choose what two days we work at home. Um, and then I'm three days in the office. Working the hybrid schedule has been a huge win for me because I have great work-life balance. Now, 
。那呃，比如说像现在我就是在我家工作，基本上呢，我只要有一台电脑在手，其实我就可以工作。It is not just about uh, being good at what you are doing in your work, but at the same time ensuring that uh, your personal well-being and your uh, mental status is all good enough so that you can perform well in your work. Recently, Micron has started conducting workshops to ensure that well-being of our mental health is taken as a priority. So, 呃，这在我生命中不能没有这两个东西。那美光它给我很大的支持，就是说，当我在呃工作之余的时间，我是可以非常的去享受在这些活动上，甚至于说。I had the most full life balance I had in three or four years. I work Monday to Friday and I work office hours, so I have my weekends free when I spend time with my wife. And also, we do have our, our own very own wellness days every monthly when we. Relax as a whole department. I spend a lot of time with my dog, with my fiance, um, doing typical Boise outdoor things, hiking, biking, skiing, anything along those lines. Micron really supports our mental well-being, giving us that support that we need to get to what we want to. Uh, that is what I really like about its culture of Micron. It's going to be a challenge at Burn Dairy when you know the, the the processing department decides to take off a well-being day. As a group. Okay. <laughs> this is going to be interesting, okay? Because we're going to have to compete with my five foot boys. That way, okay? I think I thought that was a pretty impressive um, story that they have in terms of how they approach employees. Um, and you know they're a huge company now, and, and you know I don't. This isn't mythological. This is real stuff. So it's going to be really interesting from so many different standpoints. Um, I think, what else do I got here? Oh, I wanted to talk just for a minute or two about um, economic development right here in, um, in Aurora. It um, was just a, awarded a, um, there's a consortium of, of three villages of um, uh, Cayuga, Union Springs, and Aurora got together, you know, collaboratively, which is, which is always a good way to do things. Pardon me, I forgot the microphone. Um, and and um, we're just awarded $10 million in, in um, um, grant money to, um, for a number of different projects. There's a number of different projects involved here. Um, one of them is Wells College. Well, uh, you can read this here, um, the renovation of, of Cleveland Hall. Um, and, oh, interestingly enough here, it's intended for the use of the Wells College Institute for Worship Partnerships. All right. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Huh? Um, so. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I just like to say one thing to the students in this room. I, I really kind of envy you. I, I think you, there's tremendous possibilities for all of you. There's just so many jobs out there. There's a lot of ways to do things. There's, um, there's a lot of potential. Um, and I think that um, these are times that, that you, know, I, I, you know, always doing your long-term plan is hard. It's hard to plan for, your, for, your, for what you want to do for the long term. But um, I think there's a tremendous amount of opportunity, and I think there's going to be tremendous opportunity right here in central New York. And um, I thank you very much for your time today, and um, it's been a pleasure to be here, okay? So thank you. We went a little bit longer than I intended there, Jonathan. That's okay. Um, if you want to take a couple questions. Right. Does anybody have a question they'd like to ask? Um, here's one. I do. We have a lot of students in the life sciences and in the health sciences here, um, as well as the liberal arts background. And I'm just wondering, as somebody who's been in the business of uh, biological science for a long time, what are some of the hardest? Well, what are some of the opportunities out there once kids graduate that some place like Burned Area would be really interested in hiring them for? Well, it's, it's just, I, I was a pre-med for a couple of years myself, and um, the biology and chemistry and physics and uh, um, 
the science projects, the, the science courses that I took served me very, very well. I mean, when I got to Burn Dairy, I knew what a bacteria was, you know, and uh, that was very helpful, and, and I got a head start in, in terms of a lot of things. I, I, there's a lot of quality assurance, obviously, um, that comes out of life sciences, and certainly just, just in, the, in the healthcare um, industry itself, there's all kinds of opportunity. That for people that, that have some science background. Personally, I, you know, look, I, I'm kind of a liberal arts, you know, grad, you know, as is Nancy. You know, we think it served us pretty well. We think we learned how to think pretty well. We think we, you know, it's nice to know what art is a little bit in music and, and uh, literature and uh, all those things. We, we place a very high value on that. But um, you also should take a look at the sciences in terms of, of trying yourself out um, in terms of your ability to, to deal with that. And, and you may find that, that between somewhere in there, uh, if there's one story about today, here it is. A rising tide raises all the boats, okay? That's where central New York is. Whether you're in life sciences, whether you're in, in whether you wanna be a psychologist, if you're, as, as, the, as he said, you know, the, the dentist offices that are going to be needed. There's just going to be demand across the board for a lot of different varieties and a lot of different um, 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 uh, opportunities with respect to um, careers. I, I'm not sure if I answered your question very well, but I tried. Here. Anything, anybody else have a question? Here, we got a couple up in the back. First off, thank you for the presentation. This was really great, and congratulations on all of your accomplishments. I'm still new to New York State, so I'm still trying to learn about the area. But you mentioned you have close affiliation with local farmers, which is really, really great. And this has certainly been essential to your success. Um, you mentioned that New York State is unique due to the terrain, climate, and weather. And you think it's the best place uh, you can think of for dairy. How do you think New York State is different than like other dairy capitals like Wisconsin that best helps your business? Um, Wisconsin actually is quite quite similar to New York in terms of, of dairy country. They're, they actually produce more milk than New York State. The uniqueness of New York State is this incredibly good milk supply close to the entire, I'll draw it this way, the Northeast Corridor. Start Boston, New York City, Philadelphia, you know, the, we're, we're from this area here, you can reach like 80 million people in five hours from an area that has a, a milk supply that's almost as strong as Wisconsin. Now, California is a special case. There's been a lot of subsidization of the dairy industry in California that hasn't happened in the rest of the country. Um, so, in, in as a matter of fact, there's a lot of dairy farmers moving out of the Central Valley of California right now. The, the dairy farming is really on the decline in, in California. Dairy farming is, it, I, 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 I'll be honest, I'm surprised how well we've held up. We, we, have, we have some cheese plants that have opened up. Obviously, um, you know, right up the road, you know, we talk about, as I said, there's a lot of success stories. One of them is, is a group of dairy farmers, like 27 dairy farmers right in this area, who built, you know, a world-class, you know, dry products plant in Auburn, okay? And they've done a great job. They're doing. They're they're really doing well. As a matter of fact, I think they had an office here in Aurora for a long time. Um, uh, Cayuga, I, I, Cayuga milk ingredients, I think it's called. Um, so that's just some. Of, I think, but the really unique part is is the the fact that that we have really good great agriculture, and we also have access to this entire northeast seaboard. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there was another question in the back there. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, doubles advocate question. Uh, even though Burn Dairy is a dairy product company, has the company ever considered dairy alternatives? Um, yeah. It, it, and look, we, we've, we've always made a lot of non dairy. I mean, we don't. I, I guess we should be more of advocates for some of those products which, which are special and, and that, are, that really are great products. I mean, I have great respect for the products that have, you know, cut, you know, cut into the dairy industry, um, except that their protein's not as high. We've actually run non-dairy creamer for years and years, which is a non-dairy product. We've always, we've done a lot of juices. We've done a lot of, um, um, 
we've done a lot of, uh, um, for example, well, um, I'm trying to think of, uh, there were some other products that we made non-dairy, but, but one, one of the things that, one of the things about that though, is that um, product separation is a really big deal. Um, I was, you know, it, it, being in quality assurance, I, I really didn't like, you know, sometimes that we were forced to, to do things in the plant to keep the sales department happy that really created um, product separation pr problems for us in the plant, okay? Product separation is a really big deal. If, if, you, um, if, you, if you have a plant-based product and you get milk into that, um, you've got a really bad issue. I don't know if people have heard about there was a really, really bad case in New York City of um, some uh, cookies that had peanuts in them, and there was a young barrel, ballerina, you know, just who passed away um, from anaphylactic shock. You know, so there's those kind of issues. If it was up to me, I would keep I would keep plant-based products in a separate plant. Now, maybe we, maybe we could build a, a plant-based you know uh, factory, um, but the plant-based product. <laughs> and look. I get the ecological issues, I, the dairy farming, the dairy, the dairy farms and cows and all that stuff. We're really trying to work on water pollution. We're trying to work on methane emissions, um, and certainly um, um, issues like that. Okay, um, whether or not we're going to keep everybody happy, I'm not sure. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. I have a, a, a feedback comment, and then I have um, a, like, a, another comment. Um, <laughs> I lived in Vermont for a dozen years after college, and I live in Ohio now, so, and then I grew up in New York, so I, I grew up drinking corn dairy milk, uh, best chocolate milk. Um, and those three states are the top maple syrup producers, and we know our farmers are struggling in the country, so... A number one, it's wild to me that there's not the maple uh, creamies that they have in Vermont, which is a higher milk fat product and like super popular with tourists. And this is a super popular area for tourism, right? Finger Lakes between wine and the waterfalls and all that stuff. So you really need to be getting, uh, collecting, uh, working with our maple farmers. Um, Great. I, look, look I'll pass that information on. I, the, you know, I, I could see us making that product, like at, at the ice cream creams. plant, we could do yeah, it. Yeah, not, you know? not the maple walnuts. <laughs> the soft serve in the stores or, the, or, oh, or okay. in, a, in a half gallon, but without the walnuts. Right, yeah. All right. Okay. Higher, higher fat content. It's very tasty, and Ohio and New York are completely missing out on it. So, okay, so that's anybody from Vermont? Do you guys know creamies? No? Yeah. Okay. But can I make one comment though? It's amazing how there'll be a product like that that's so successful, like nobody else picks it up. I mean, in this in the in this internet age, how does that happen? But I'm not you know, wrong. I lived there for a dozen years. Right. No, I don't. I don't think you're wrong either. I, I think it's an opportunity that that yeah. you know. There, but there's stories like there's a million stories like that all through the history where. Yes. Just a little, a little fact, you know, turned yeah. everything. Give know? it to Mary of um, of the fish food. Give it to her. Oh yeah, I'll give it to her. Right, <laughs> and me, going back to Vermont, like Ben and Jerry's, it's such a tourism stop um, in Vermont. And same, I mean, I'm, I grew up in Watkins Glen, so it's a huge tourism area. Aurora, huge tourism. Why aren't you just doing something like maybe with the Burn Dairy Hollow Farm? Right. Of doing something where you're able to get a tourism industry there, and that's going to help with job growth, and it's also going to, um, you know, make money for you. Um, and you could do something like Shelburne Farms, you could do, like, right. historical stuff, you yeah. could do concerts there. Like Nancy and I love Shelburne Farms. Um, We've been yeah. there many times, so, yeah. um, Nancy, I work um, with uh, Una and Audrey in our alum office, sure. so I knew your name, but I didn't know the connection. Okay, we're running a little bit late here, so, okay, um, okay thank you. Um, just finish up, John. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Folks, um, first of all, I want to thank Phil and Nancy, and I want to give you a I Heart Wellesley oh, wow. nod. Yeah. And then, if you will join us in the atrium, um, Bill has 
brought along and we have supplemented. There's, uh, you have an opportunity to taste some uh, burned dairy milk, some of their ultra pasteurized products, um, chip witches and other things. So thank you all again for coming.